The global coronavirus outbreak has pushed the U.S. healthcare system to its brink. Hospitals are already running out of basic supplies like masks, eye gear, gowns, and ventilators. Ventilators are key in helping keep people with the most severe cases of COVID-19 alive. But with the number of infected rising daily, there are not nearly enough of them, and there's no easy way to get more. Are there enough ventilators in this country? In a worst-case scenario, ventilators would be one of the uh, choke points, if you will, for effective response. There are about 160,000 ventilators in the United States now, and there's another 12 or 13,000 in a stockpile that are intended to be used in emergencies. But most hospitals say that this will not be enough, especially if coronavirus cases keep climbing. And you're seeing hospitals across the country sound the alarm and say, is there a way that we can get an emergency supply so that we don't have to make the decisions about who lives and who dies? In 2005, the U.S. Department of Health and Human Services estimated that the U.S. would need 740,000 ventilators in a severe pandemic like the Spanish flu of 1918. That number is a far cry from the 173,000 ventilators that it's estimated we currently have on hand. Before the outbreak, ventilators accounted for just $4.3 billion of the $425.5 billion global medical device market. Ventilators are critical in treating the most severe cases of the coronavirus, where inflammation prevents people from taking in enough air on their own. They work by blowing air through a breathing tube that's placed in the patient's windpipe, allowing oxygen to flow into the lungs. The reason for the shortage now is because we are seeing cases of the pandemic continue to climb across the U.S. And a lot of the models would suggest that we're going to see a big spike in the next couple of weeks. Most people don't think that we've hit the peak yet when it comes to this, this pandemic. And a lot of the patients who end up in the hospital do need to be on a ventilator. When the patients first come in to the hospital with, with severe conditions, actually you can use a lower grade ventilator. But in general, you need more of the lower, uh, the less acute ones and fewer of the critical care ones. But obviously with the caveat that uh, the critical care ones are the ones that's most needed uh, when patients are, are, in, are in very severe condition. We have already seen this play out in Italy. What we're seeing now in, in Italy is that they uh, lack ventilators and doctors are in this crazy position of deciding who to ventilate and who not to ventilate. They're, they're rationing care. We know from studies out of China, for example, that about 17% or so of coronavirus patients actually require a ventilator. So we're, we're not talking about, you know, a large capacity, but when you look at the number of people that are going to be infected by coronavirus, that translates to many, many people. And that's why we're worried about this. Some of the biggest ventilator manufacturers like Medtronic PLC, Philips, Dragerwork AG, and Gettinga are racing to ramp up production. Philips has said that the company is looking to double the ventilators that it makes per week from 1,000 to 2,000 initially, but hopes to achieve a fourfold increase by the third quarter. In a statement, Philips said it is hiring additional manufacturing employees, adding manufacturing lines, and instituting round-the-clock shifts. Medtronic is transferring workers from its other factories to Galway, Ireland. That's where the company makes its Puritan line of ventilators. Medtronic says it has already increased production by more than 40% and has doubled its capacity. We're going to open source uh, one of our lower end ventilators in less acute situations for others to, uh, to make as quickly as they can. Uh, this, this product is uh, a little more generic in form and uh, can be probably made a little more easily than the one we make, which requires uh, many components and some of the components require very pre precise uh, manufacturing. But smaller companies are affected, too. Ventec Life Systems in Washington says that it's moving from its typical production of 150 machines a month to 1,000 per month. We are in a dire situation where no hospital in the U.S. can have enough ventilators uh, because this is, I think this is going to get really, really bad. We're a major hospital and we have, we're associated with smaller hospitals and we're a referral hospital. So if a smaller hospital in the surrounding area lacks capacity, they're going to send those patients to our hospital. So we're going to get overwhelmed pretty quickly. Now, governments and individuals are coming up with some unconventional ways to stem the ventilator shortage. The UK government has turned to a wartime solution, asking manufacturers like vacuum company Dyson and luxury car maker Rolls-Royce to produce essential equipment. 
President Trump has also encouraged automakers to aid in the production of ventilators. But there have been conflicting messages as to whether the president is formally enforcing the Defense Protection Act. The statute forces manufacturers to produce scarce materials deemed essential to the national defense. This includes face masks and ventilators. But for now, Trump is encouraging local governments to act. First of all, governors are supposed to be doing a lot of this work, and they are doing a lot of this work. The federal government's not supposed to be out there buying vast amounts of items and then shipping. You know, we're not a shipping clerk. A number of governors and mayors have criticized the administration for not doing enough to help local communities deal with the pandemic. FEMA says we're sending 400 ventilators. Really? What am I going to, what am I going to do with 400 ventilators when I need 30,000? You pick the 26,000 people who are going to die because you only sent 400 ventilators. The Federal Defense Procurement Act can actually help companies because the federal government can say, look, I need you to go into this business. I will contract with you today for X number of ventilators. Here is the startup capital you need. Only the federal government has that power. And not to exercise that power is inexplicable to me. The federal government has been absent. So, for example, we've repeatedly asked the Secretary of Health and Human Services uh, to get us ventilators. We need 15,000 ventilators and we need them right away. I would like to see uh, 100,000 ventilators being built in in a couple of weeks on on a federal level. But states alone trying to figure out how to do this is not a good solution. An individual hospital trying to figure out how to do this is not a good solution. Without a federal law in place to nationalize the purchase of medical supplies, states are having to compete with other states for supplies and dealing with price gouging. I think the federal government should order factories to manufacture masks, gowns, ventilators, the essential medical equipment that's going to make the difference between life and death. Even ventilator manufacturers are asking for more clarity from the government when it comes to determining how to allocate the ventilators they produce. So right now, every week we go through an acuity analysis of where the greatest need is, depending on uh, you know how many patients have been diagnosed and what state they're in, and we kind of try to prioritize it that way. But we're also uh, um, sort of proposing that the uh, that in the United States there's a centralized uh, body through FEMA who can do the uh, allocation and then they can move these uh, ventilators around. That would be a much more efficient process than us trying to do it. The U.S. is not the first country to experience these shortages, and it won't be the last. Some equipment manufacturers are saying that America is towards the back of the queue when it comes to accessing these ventilators because they have already been sold and in use in other countries that needed them before we did. On Sunday, Trump announced in a tweet that GM, Ford, and Tesla have been given the go-ahead to make ventilators. But it seems that many of these automotive manufacturers are partnering with medical device companies rather than producing ventilators on their own. And the details of these partnerships have been vague. GM has announced that it is leveraging its logistics, purchasing, and manufacturing expertise to help Ventec Life Systems. Meanwhile, Ford is partnering with GE in manufacturing ventilators, though the company has not said where they will be manufactured. In a tweet, Elon Musk said that he purchased 1,255 ventilators from China and was shipping them to LA. Tesla is also partnering with Medtronic to build some less complex ventilators. We're also opening up uh, with other partners who've uh, come forward. And uh, Tesla is one that uh, I think people have heard about, uh, where uh, one of our ventilators will be made by them, and they're uh, fast on track to try to make that as well. And uh, they're doing that in parallel, um, while we're focusing on the product that we, uh, that is our largest volume product, which is the PB980. The car companies had already planned to suspend auto production at their plants in an effort to safeguard their employees from the coronavirus. Some automotive experts seem confident they can handle the volume. What we're talking about here is, by automotive standards, relatively, relatively low volume manufacturing. We're talking about initially maybe a couple of hundred units a day. Uh, you know, not 14, 15,000 a day like the big automakers produce. And all these automakers have conventional shops. 
where they make their own tooling and they make prototype parts, which are kind of divorced from the big manufacturing plants. And those prototype shops um, are manned by highly skilled workers who can, you know, read drawings or read computer printouts and make things. And the tooling for the type of thing we're talking about, like a ventilator, that that doesn't have like 3,000 parts like an automobile does. It probably has a couple of dozen, and they're all relatively simple. It will look like uh, an automotive assembly line in the 20s or 30s. Uh, so it'll be relatively primitive. Uh, it'll be on reusable equipment. It'll involve a lot of human labor, uh, but the job will get done. Lutz said that assuming car makers can get the parts, they would be able to start producing ventilators in 10 days to two weeks. But medical experts say it may not be that simple. It's not something, you know, they can just give GM a plan of and that they can start producing it. But I do think that using workers from, let's say, automakers and so on to come help GE and these other companies in a limited fashion to build more ventilators could really, really help. There are over a hundred of these smaller component parts that go into a ventilator. And across the world, as this becomes a global pandemic, many of these supplies are going to be stretched because it won't just be the United States that needs these parts. Even if a car company has experience producing air filtration devices, there is a significant gap between what that might look like and how a ventilator functions. It is a very, very complicated machine. Uh, when you are intubated, right, and you're on a ventilator, you are either conscious or not, and the machine senses exactly how much pressure and how much volume of air to put into your lungs so as to give you enough oxygen but not to damage your lungs by expanding them too much. It's a very complicated sensing process that it goes through, so it's not something that's easy to kind of develop. And beyond technical specifications, the entire process of producing a ventilator is usually tightly regulated and involves sometimes years-long testing periods. But the FDA is relaxing some of these restrictions, saying that manufacturers that would normally need FDA clearance to modify a ventilator could now do it without an agency review. In theory, this should help speed up production. But with ventilators ranging from $25,000 for the basic models to $50,000 for those used in intensive care units, the question then becomes, can hospitals afford them? A lot of hospitals are holding off on uh, ordering ventilators because of the financial implications of this. And again, I think this is an issue with smaller hospitals. This could bankrupt many of those smaller hospitals. And if they don't come into use, right, what are they going to do with all this after? Besides the upfront cost, ventilators also require a large investment from hospitals in staff and training. Right now, it needs a trained medical team, a respiratory therapist, a nurse, and some kind of doctor that's usually a pulmonologist. It's a lot of resources for one ventilator and for one patient. The do-it-yourself community has also taken up the charge to create more ventilators in light of the shortage. There's a lot of designs out there that I've seen from developing a DIY device that squeezes a bag uh, to give breaths to a patient, to how do we use one ventilator, a jerry-rig it so it ventilates four patients instead of one patient. I've never used any of these before, but I'm impressed with the enthusiasm In Italy, a group of engineers 3D printed replacement ventilator valves after the manufacturer couldn't provide them and their regional hospital ran out. Printer maker HP has also said that it would pitch in and use its 3D printer technology to build things like ventilator valves, breathing filters, and face mask clasps. Something that we've also seen is some of these 3D printing startups that are helping to make, you know, emergency ventilators. Um, different reusable parts. I think that will have a part to play if things get really, really bad. But these parts are often protected by both intellectual property laws and manufacturing regulations, so they have to be reverse engineered before they can be produced. In Ireland, a group of over 300 engineers, designers, and tech founders banded together to design an easy-to-build emergency ventilator. Another more hands-on approach that's been discussed is to use human volunteers, whether they be medical students, nursing students, or someone from the military, to manually ventilate for patients. It may sound crazy, but it's been it's been done before. Uh, in the 1952 uh, Copenhagen polio crisis, they had medical student volunteers uh, ventilating patients by hand. And in some very low resource countries, that unfortunately is what happens. Ku and his team at Thomas Jefferson University Hospital hope to use this as a backup plan, especially since using human ventilators would put those individuals at risk of infection as well. We've been working on 
how to make that process as safe as possible for the um, human ventilator <laughs> that you know want to make sure they're in full-on protective gear and the bag that actually is used to ventilate the patient with 3D printing and connection piece to put on top of that bag to prevent the coronavirus from uh, leaking out. Where the U.S. finds itself now is the result of many things, but one of them is undoubtedly lack of planning. We don't have ventilators because we did not anticipate and plan accordingly. I mean, we should have been done testing months ago. Testing is not going to contain COVID-19. It's, it's already spread. It's uncontainable right now. And if we don't prepare right now, we're going to be screwed in a couple of weeks. The storm is coming and you can't just make a ventilator overnight or on demand. So we need to start building right now today for where we're going to be in a couple of weeks. And I, I, can't, I just can't stress this enough. 